and the goal was to bring you your next favorite band. Thanks for having us. This is a very cool show. Yeah, so we through many, many iterations, and it finally, yes. finally landed on the weirdest one by far. We yeah, just a couple of feelings, and uh, boom, you got a song. Yeah. I, I remember this one time. I had been writing some songs, and I and I went out. This I'm just going right in on this story. I went out, and so I was. Ah, uh, uh, the story's longer than the song itself. We'll go ahead and play it. So. And listen, it's going to be everybody's favorite band. <laughs> Welcome to your next favorite band. That's both the show title and our promise to you. We here at Stereophilia Studio are tireless in our pursuit of finding incredible, genre-defiant artists who are either a hot up-and-coming band or a group that has been delivering for years but have flown under the radar. Tonight, we have the orchestral indie rock of the Family Crest. Each month, we will bring you live streams, audio podcasts, and perhaps even a live concert where you can listen to the stories and hear the music of artists personally curated by us based on what we feel will be worthy of your time. Be sure to subscribe and tune in to each episode because the possibilities are endless and you never know who will be your next favorite band. Hello, everyone. I am your host, Philip Reese. Hello, I am David Moore, the co-host. And this is your next favorite band. I think we're getting better at that. Yeah, I mean, we're working on it. We've got to <laughs> sort of get like, I feel like there's a smoke signal or something that still needs to draw this all together. So it like will be right on point. And then once yeah. we do that, we can mess it up every time. Yeah, we can retire at that point. Oh, <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> uh, but how are you, David? I'm doing all right. How about you, Philip? I'm I'm doing. Fa yeah, I, I heard you had a terrific old fashioned last night. Oh, it was so good. Let me tell you all about it. For yeah, forty five <laughs> minutes. I will recount the <laughs> terribleness of the cocktail I thought uh, I was getting last night. I do. So uh, for the audience, I, we do wish that sometimes we recorded the banter that happens. Like we do knucklehead banter, but there's some wonderful banter that happens in the moments before a show starts and. David just turned to me and he said, I had a terrible old fashioned last night. And I said, that sounds like the title of your memoir. So we just went on from there and it was a great 20 minutes of memoir yes. writing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, look, be on the lookout for that in roughly 20 to 28 years. Yeah. Random house is totally all right. You should see the offers I'm getting right now. Right. In the, yeah. By the end of this, uh, you know, put it in the show notes. Sure. I mean, David was leaving the show because of his huge publishing deal he was handed because <laughs> of the... exactly right. Everyone wants to know the recipe for the old fashioned. Yeah. And then at the end, I just go, and it's disappointing. And it's highly disappointing. So um, real quick, before we bring on today's uh, guests, um, I came across this interesting little tidbit and I thought, why not I ask David this completely out of left field? Look, awesome. <laughs> right. <laughs> So this was uh, a listing of, I think there's actually 14 on the list. So I just wanted to maybe get your guess at a top three, top five, whatever. No, you okay. Let's we'll see how far I miss. Right. Um, so this is the listing of people, bands, artists who had the most weeks at number one on the Billboard album charts. And this album is, I think, charts. album charts and collective. So like not just any one of them, just the artist or the band. How many different times were they number one for the album they had released? So just fire away give me three so four five the number of the number of times they were number one or the number of weeks they were at number total one? number of weeks weeks and so Co this is cumulatively through, of all and their this albums. is through now through now it, yes okay. very I much now. double check because mm -hmm. there's some oddball outlook so uh can you cumulative weeks i'll go with something like michael jackson michael jackson was one two three four fifth on the list 51 okay. weeks at number yeah, one i'll go with um the soundtrack to uh west side story so again, remember multiple albums by Michael Jackson. Oh, I, I see how cumulatively. Not, not an individual one. Correct. I see. Okay, so, so then I'll, that probably I'll, did well, but yeah, it, so up against I'll, somebody with repeated albums. Okay, so uh, something probably like Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift, number three, fifty-five yeah. weeks at number one. Thanks. Uh, let's see if I can guess. I'm getting get one more. Top. Oh, number one is tough. It's going to be something like the Bee Gees. No, Bee Gees not on the list. Well, then one more try. One more try. Uh, 
See, the gut says the Beatles, but they didn't. Their albums didn't do that. No, like, they that, they were. They're really like head and shoulders. The Beatles, 132 weeks at number one. They are more than double number two. Hmm. Who's number you, two? Number two, Elvis Presley. I'm intrigued by this list. I'd like yeah. to see their 67 weeks. Method number one, you guessed Taylor Swift, 55, Michael Jackson, fifth at 51. We're going to leave the left rest of the list. Maybe we'll even ask our guests today for some guesses on that. But uh, but anyway, yeah. So uh, and actually, even Elvis Presley, I was watching the Baz Luhrmann movie about Elvis. I thought it was mm -hmm. really quite entertaining. Uh, that's with uh, Tom Hanks is in that. Is it Tom uh, Hanks is in it? Tom yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, you learn a lot. Like it's it's very, um, very much a biopic. Mm -hmm. um, and if you like Baz Luhrmann's stuff in the past, then you'll like this one. If you don't like that stuff, I recommend not watching it. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, that brings us to this week's guest. I can't tell you how excited. I, I mean, I, people, I think my close friends have called me out. I'm often like a fanboy when I bring people on and I don't really care. Like I just I, these are bands and artists and musicians that I thoroughly admire. I think they do an amazing job and I want them to know that. And we're going to do that again today. Um, because I think this is one of the most talented and beautiful musicians and songwritings that are out there. And I just, that's another reason why they're on the show. We hope they become your next favorite band. Um, so we're going to share some of their music here. Um, the band is called The Family Crest. They're out of San Francisco. And um, they have not only beautiful music, but a very cool story. And we're going to get into all of this. Um, <clears throat> but uh, but a little ways back, they had a an album called uh, Beneath the Brine. It was actually released in 2014. Um, but this is kind of one of their anthems, if you will. Um, and you'll see what I mean by that. And they always have very cool videos that go with their music. And so this is a song called The World. Uh, and it's by the Family Crest. So we'll let some of this play and then we'll bring David in for a bio. Hit it, David. The Family Crest is the brainchild of composer, vocalist, and multi-instrumentalist Liam McCormick. Or or orchestral indie band The Family Crest was started as a recording project with co-founder John Setterlin on bass as a final release before bowing out of the industry. Instead of leaving music, they were inspired by their peers to set out to reinvent how a band could be created, starting The Family Crest with an audacious and bold vision of cultivating a musical community quote, always like making music with people, getting a bunch of people together and singing, so we put ads everywhere. Says McCormick, we posted on Craigslist, distributed flyers, and emailed old friends from school. The outcome was greater than the original duo imagined, with over 80 people credited on the first recording. The band produced and over 500 musicians credited throughout their catalog. The Family Crest has released three full-length albums and three EPs, including their critically acclaimed breakout LP, Beneath the Brine. Most recently, the band has been releasing pieces of their current musical concept album series, The War, 
with the latest addition to the series, The War, Act 2, being released in May of 2022. I'm just so... I, f- I fall into the music every time. <laughs> I, f- I forget that we're doing a show. Because <laughs> listen to this. Let's bring this up. Phil's doing an active listening session, and then we'll have uh, notes afterwards. <laughs> When I listen to this music, I like I I'm I feel uplifted and things are possible and I don't I just and lest you wonder whether they could recreate this live, don't you worry. It not only sounds like this but better because obviously, <laughs> live music is is what we're always going for here. But like, I I super appreciate that. It's funny watching this because it it feels like so long ago. I was, I was gonna say the same thing. It's just like, oh, look how young we were, you know. It's well, just, well, it's like we have what? What this was probably two thousand fourteen, fifteen. So it's like five years plus two pandemic years, which is <laughs> yeah. like eighteen years. Right, each. It ages you eighteen <laughs> years. Yeah, the two pandemic years for sure. Where everything <laughs> feels like it was yesterday and eighteen years ago at the same time. I completely agree with that. It's so weird. Pandemic is the weirdest thing in that you feel like it is stopped time and yet also from you know a millennia ago exactly mm-hmm. so, so welcome to the show thanks Liam for having us. and john <laughs> we just let that song go because it is i don't know it just every time it gives me chills it makes me tear up like it's just and and that's just one of many like you guys have just such beautiful music um and i think it is something so special and people more people need to be hearing it oh thank I, you I super appreciate that uh it, it's it's so fun to make this music with mm-hmm. with so many amazing people, and you know I've I've learned to compose music through this music, and so every every single song and every album is a new lesson in a weird way. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But yeah, like anytime we listen to this stuff, you know, when John and I edit the music, you know, getting it ready to release, there's these moments where you're listening to these stacks of different instrumentalists that we've recorded in all these various sessions, sure. and you know, you spend a little time on each one. And then, at the, and you have these memories associated to each one of those pieces of audio. And then at the end of it, you hit play and you hear like, and see in your head all those different yeah. memories at one time. And it's this very unique, uh, unexpected, unintended thing of like, oh, all of my friends and family are in this audio place living yep. forever, you know? Mm-hmm. It's, it's it's fun. It's absolutely uh, inspiring. Like, it really is. It's just such great music. Thank you. Yeah. Thank and you, you, you you have things there too. Like you, you talked about orchestrating. So like you have a songwriting style where it's you, the song is written and then you orchestrate it from what I understand. And so um, you, I don't know if you mind sharing something on, on mm-hmm. that. And the other thing I thought that was interesting too, is if you just go to your site and you look at people's roles. So obviously when we prepare for these things, it's like a guitar, bass, so on and so forth. And you put voice, not vocals. And I, so to me, it's like you're viewing the voice as yet another instrument to be used in a song. Oh, a hundred percent. And I yeah. just thought that stood out to me because not everybody does that. Yeah. I mean, th- it's funny because I think vocalists are generally, they're generally looked at as like, even, even sometimes within the musician community is like, Oh, well, you know, it's, it's just the voice. And there is like <laughs> a part of me that, you know, whenever I see somebody just like shredding on a piano or a guitar that I wish my fingers could do that. Mm-hmm, I'm, a very, mm-hmm. I'm a chord player, you know, so it's like I play, I can do a lot of chords, but, <laughs> but <I'm not laughs> fast. My, my brain does not go from here to here fast enough to make these things happen, but sure. my voice does. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely an instrument, you know? Mm-hmm. So. Well, we had a guest on once that was talking about how the voice is, I forget the word they use, but the point was, if you're playing guitar wrong, a teacher can show you your hands need to be here or your finger needs to be there. Same thing, piano, same thing, other thing. But no one can look at your vocal cords and be like, you're doing this wrong. Like they can only just listen to you and yeah. give you advice that may not be the problem. Yeah, it's it's all audio based, 100%. I mean, you can look at the vocal cords, but you can't really sing with a camera down your throat. Right, um, right. But, but yeah, you, you, you can, 
You can I have yeah. tried. Someone probably <laughs> recorded that somewhere along the way. <laughs> there, there actually is a video of Steven Tyler's yeah, vocal cords. That's exactly what I was thinking. It's like, it's, it's <laughs> a Steven Tyler because he's like an anomaly. He's had like a bunch of vocal surgeries and sure. so, but you know, and he but he like shreds still. So like, what is the deal with his voice? And they, you know, mm -hmm. it, he, yeah, he's an anomaly. I yeah. watched a video of him doing Dream On. I think it was at like Howard Stern's birthday party, and this was mm -hmm. a few years ago. And I'm watching him start the song and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe he's doing this. He's mm -hmm. like pretty old and sure, you know, and, and, and then he goes and I'm like, here comes the high note. And I've been in that position, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. so I'm like, here it comes. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. and he nails it. And I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah. anomaly there. Yeah, the yeah. voice, it, it's interesting too, because, you know, it changes over time. So, I mean, it, one of the things I was thinking of when, when that video was playing is I... I was listening to my voice and it sounds so different. And right after we recorded those, I got um, surgery, like tonsillectomy. Oh, and wow. that's my gotta voice, be scary. Yeah, it was a little scary going into it. I mean, sure. I, you know, it was, it's your voice. So, mm -hmm. but um, I trusted my, my doctor. She was incredible. And, and it was one of those things though, where it did, it, it opened up my, my cord area and, and, if you think about the voice, it's what it sounds like in your own head and what the rest of the world hears are completely different. Very different. Oh, very much so. Right. Mm -hmm. And and the way that, you know, the voice just isn't here and here. It's it's the head. It's yep. it, right. This whole thing is this acoustic thing. And, you know, yep. the way you hold your jaw and the way you all these different things. Mm -hmm. So the smallest change can really affect it. And it it definitely sounds different. And I yeah, it's it's interesting to hear it. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the orchestrations, like uh, anything you can share there on how like the songwriting process comes to you or, or the, pro the process you go through, because it just when I was reading about it, it seemed pretty interesting. Yeah, it, 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 I try to be as organic as possible with songwriting. Um, so if I have an idea for something, I'll hum it. You know, you'll probably see me looking like a crazy person with my phone <laughs> in my ear, walking in the grocery store, singing something into it. John's seen that countless times. Yep, yep, yep. The, the um, best no, I'll let you finish and then I'll, I'll no, say go ahead. <laughs> I'll say the best thing about Liam like showing you his song is that he, he, you know, he has like, he's at this point, he's like thought of like the different orchestration in the head. So he tries to like sing it all. Like what's the important part. So he's like singing with the lyric. He's like, da, da. he's like, you know, da, 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 da. And then, and then, you know, like he tries to do it all. It's like, you get it? You get it? It's like, yeah, I get it. You know, and, on well, it, and at this point, I actually do. I'm like, yeah, I know exactly what you're, you know. Weirdly, I do get it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think Obviously, the there's the glockenspiel part I heard you hum. So I'm on yeah, top yeah. of that. Yeah, bing, bing, bing. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> the reason that John and I actually have always worked so well together is because he, he kind of spoke my language for the entire sure. time, which not a lot of people did. I, I remember showing my dad who's obviously known me for my entire life um, <laughs> and listened to me play constantly. I remember showing him the first version of just me playing the acoustic versions of the songs off the village. And I think it was before your father hears us, which is you kind of need the orchestra in that. Otherwise it, it acoustically is very strange. Sure. Um, and he just did not get it. He was like, I mean, it sounds pretty, <laughs> but like, I have no idea what you're doing. And, and John the whole time, like obviously over time, he, he now understands pretty much anything that I do. I'll be like, bleh, 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 and he'll be like, Oh yeah, that's a trumpet. But, um, <laughs> but even at the time he understood generally what it was. And, and from a songwriting perspective, um, when I say it's, it's as organic as I can make it, I'll usually, once I have an idea, I'll sit down with a guitar and I'll, I'll play or piano or whatever it is. And I'll play out, try to play the whole song. So it's not, um, it, it's not like here's the verse and then I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. It's like mm -hmm. I'm once I have an idea of like where the verse and chorus go, which generally kind of comes in tandem, I'll try to play the whole song and I will sing, you know, 50 percent of it's probably scatting and 50 percent of sure. it is is whatever's coming out of my face at the moment. <laughs> um, and then it's, it's interesting because lyrically, I'll usually you know, I'm listening to that demo over and over again. And so those, sure. whatever I'm singing for better or worse burns into my head. And I actually think that's a good thing because I've always looked at it like whatever I'm singing there is it's something like whatever's coming out of me. If I'm in that organic state, there's something coming out that's meaningful. And, mm -hmm. and then I'll try to break that down later on and, and write the lyrics and contextualize them from that. And then the orchestration is, is, 
strange because it's it's almost like um, like I can hear everything at the beginning, but I have to figure out what that thing in my head is, right? So it's mm -hmm. like, you know, I'll maybe write it as a violin and go, oh, wait, no, that's an oboe. Um, sure. But at the beginning, it was incredibly confusing because I, <laughs> right. I, I didn't... Well, I even read that sometimes it could change the genre too. Like you have oh, yeah. written a song in, the one I read about was it was written in a Bollywood style, but when you change the bass instrument suddenly it became jazzy like it was like this interesting thing then you had to even changed your vocal style so like mm -hmm. um and then you added saxophone anyway I, again i just kind of oh, i love i love nerding out about that kind of stuff because it's like that's fascinating like it just it turned is really, the song completely on its ear that's one of the things that i also love about about this band is you know working with all these different instrumentalists and and being kind of chaotic in in all the genres that you know come with that because you mm -hmm. hear all sorts of different music from new people and things you oh, totally experience. right right, right. And you you slowly realize if you listen to a bunch of different genres of music, how things are connected that you never saw before. Yes. So right. sure. in the yeah. song Waiting Still, there's this song or there's a line. The, the main melody is da 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 dum, da 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 dum. And in my head, that was always an air who, which is like an Asian, like a Chinese. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds very kind of yeah it just has that sound to it and then as we started playing and i was like this almost sounds like 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 indigenous you know in a weird way sure, and, sure. And, yeah no i can hear it you know or like in in if you listen to uh sell yourself lightly that's like has this very klezmer sound mm -hmm. to it you know that is also i was thinking more like balkan jazz at that point which is obviously klezmer influence but then if you listen to like music from like even Egypt, you'll sure. hear that klezmer influence mm -hmm. and you realize how these cultures are connected and that we yes. are so much more connected than we think we are, oh, absolutely. Just, you know, in every way. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's an, it's a fun process, you know, getting to learn again, like I learned how to write through taking <laughs> extended family members out for coffee and being like, how do you play, you know, you play the trombone <laughs> since you were four. So what, <laughs> what lines do you like to play and what do you, you, other people hate? like that composers do that play trombone, you know, like, so it's a, it's a good way to learn how to, how to do all these things and compose for different instruments. Yeah. No, that is very, very cool. Thank you for sharing all that. And yeah. I think too, um, for people listening to your music, it is something where you're going to get a completely different experience with headphones on because you're going to get a lot of the different layerings that are going on. So I highly recommend that. And even some of the stuff that you're going for that are beyond instruments, which we're going to get into as we kind of maybe talk through the different releases. But first, let's go back to the beginning, because you two are both kind of like the founders, the, the brainchild behind the whole concept, which from what I read is was going to be a one time thing and you were going to be done with it. And so here we are, what, 14 years later, and it's it's only uh, like, you know, on a, on a rise. So 2008, if I have it right, you're thinking, let's reach out to some like David shared in the bio, reach out to some musicians and maybe a couple will get back to us and we can record something. Yeah, we we had been playing in various bands and, you know, I think for me, I think for both of us, it was just this this point of, you know, as you're in the industry, you can easily get more and more jaded, mm -hmm. especially if the bands that you're in are focused heavily on, you know, the idea of of making it versus mm -hmm. the idea of like making like making something that you're proud of, you know, and like. It, it once that making it starts going more and higher and higher over like the the actual art form sure it, it for me and john i think made us pretty jaded and so mm -hmm. i remember we uh we went on a vacation i met him in ireland and i was sitting in the hallway of a, a hotel and i'd spent like two weeks listening to all this stuff that i hadn't yet like really written in full and i was playing a song i don't remember what it was he might but um but yeah he heard it and he was into it, it you was know north. and it was north it, i thought it was either north or the bells because that was paris but both yeah both of those songs yeah i mean it, it was one or the other but you i remember you played for me north in a in a uh, hotel room it was like a roadway in in dublin or something <laughs> yeah, it was and there was actually i remember we were on the stairs because there was, yeah <laughs> there was a lady vacuuming that yeah a housekeeper <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> my... yeah. but then um, when you re i hope when you recorded it you added some vacuum in the background 
you know, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story about one of those songs that actually kind of is related to that. But but yeah, we um, I remember we we sat down and, and there was this moment where John's like, we should be making this stuff. And it wasn't it, it was more in the sense of like we both had this realization that like we wanted something, you know, we'd spent X amount of time in this. We weren't sure if we were going to keep doing it. Uh, this being music. And um, we wanted something that we would be proud of. And, and so, you know, at the, at that time, I didn't even know there were, there would be copious amounts of orchestration involved. I didn't really know what it was yet. I knew there were, I think John and I talked about, yeah, there are some yeah. strings. It was, it was, well, it was interesting. Cause you know, you say like that, you know, we speak the same language and it's like, but I, but I remember at the beginning, like, I didn't know what this was. Yeah. All I knew was like, this guy writes really good songs and he has the voice of an angel and I have to attach myself to him because I can't do that. <laughs> that was... There's an opportunity here that I need to align yeah. myself with. <laughs> I was also just having like a moment of rethinking through this again, like absolutely beautiful song and this like musical partner going, Yes, I get this. And as the screen pans back, it's a roadway in, and there's some woman, <laughs> woman vacuuming. Like, <laughs> so, <Dying>. Yeah, <laughs> that'll when be in, 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 yeah, movie, in the biopic, the biopic about. Yeah. yeah, that'll be like this moment of like just sheer utter, just like the 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 beautiful music and this partnership, and then you know it's the just hoovering. Yeah. You, <laughs> by the way, you, you know, you owe us another night because you went past, you know, checkout or something like that. <laughs> no, <seriously. laughs> no, it's true. But, uh, but yeah, we, we kind of, we went through it and we just decided that we wanted to make this as a recording project. And, you know, we would kind of been dabbling with doing these little recording sessions uh, with people. And I've always loved just making music with people. And I've always loved seeing the energy of, of, you know, large groups singing together and sure. or, or making music together. Um, and I, I was only in conservatory at that point for a year. I had left after my first year mm -hmm. to focus on trying to do this stuff. Yep. Um, but in that time, I'd met quite a few people that were, I mean, that are amazing musicians. And so mm -hmm. we just reached out to people th at first through, through those connections and through the connections we'd made, like doing like popular you know, indie music at that point. Sure. And, um, and it was, a, we really did think we were going to get like, we were preparing for a few people, you mm -hmm. know, like maybe like eight, you know? Sure. Uh, and, but every one of the friends had somebody else that was like, well, Oh, like I'd like to do this or like, why don't we do this? So, you know, when we had four singers that wanted to do it, we were like, well, why don't we put together a choir? And, right. And it just slowly built and built. And, you know, it, it's like a, you give a mouse a cookie situation with me. <laughs> I was well, I'm even going to share. If you keep chatting, I'm going to bring on the say, screen. It sound like the family crest yeah. is a pyramid scheme. <laughs> you <know? laughs> you, in Fort Holt, I mean, we've been, yeah, that, there's You have too. this uh, on your website, the extended family, and it is this lengthy list of, uh, of everyone who has been credited. And from what I understand, it's over 500 people at this point. There's a lot of them. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's, I mean, there's something about, I love all of these people. There's something about making music with somebody like we, John and I did for act uh, one and two of the war. We kind of recorded mm -hmm. all that music at the same time. Um, and we did a recording tour where we, we drove out for a month. It was literally the month before we went back out on the road for a tour and recorded people in, I can't remember the amount of cities, but quite a few. And uh, a lot of the people we recorded, we'd never met before. Mm -hmm. And and now we're close friends with a ton of them, you know? And and you, it, it's just amazing to like meet people and learn from them. And, and it's incredibly humbling, you know, to, to play with just all these amazing people. Um, so yeah, it's been a crazy journey from the roadway in. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and so you also have these these people on for recordings and then also while you're on tour so you have like a six member or seven member core mm -hmm. and then you will also bring on additions to that to be part of the family if that if i have that right yeah i mean we we kind of have an open door policy um you know if somebody wants to play with us and we have enough time to to you know get it together um they're welcome on stage with us and, and i mean it's always amazing. Like I remember one specifically, um, we were playing in Boston and this girl who was still in high school, 
wanted to play sax at the show. And mm -hmm. we were like, and we found out I think day of, mm -hmm. and she was so nervous. <laughs> and, you know, we did a rehearsal and, you know, she was in high school. So she's like getting into like soloing specifically, you know, sure. not like full delved into it. Mm -hmm. And I remember for me, it's like, this is just going to be fun. Right. You know, I have complete faith in what you do. You're going to be great. And she was so nervous. And then when we got on stage, I remember the more confidence like it, that we kind of we sure. didn't care. We're like, you're going to be great. She went out and killed it. Everybody loved mm -hmm. it. And it was this <laughs> amazing thing that, you know, is burned into my brain now getting to yep. collaborate with this 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 amazing musician and the power of support. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so and trust. Yeah. And and I really do think, you know, that's something that's missing from a lot of people's lives. I mean, mm -hmm. in, in our industry, you know, it's very easy to either burn out in conservatories. It's very easy to go through the whole time yep. with this idea of I'm going to play in an orchestra or, or I'm going to be a soloist or do this. But there's just, you know, the industry in and of itself in music is incredibly difficult and getting more difficult each year. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people end up going and doing other things and never having an opportunity to really, or having very few opportunities to really play their instrument. Sure. And, you know, again, that wasn't the intent at the beginning, but as you get to know these people and you see like these people that are like, Oh, I haven't played my clarinet uh, for since high school. And I'm now, you know, 32 and they're pulling it out for the first time. It's it's amazing to watch because it's yeah. it's this weird love that they have for this thing that they put away because it, sometimes it was too hard to not put it away, you know. Yep, 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 yep. So yeah, it's 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 so humbling and amazing to work with these people. That's such a cool way to approach it um, to be able to kind of like explore people who you've never worked with before because that brings a different kind of energy. And if you all feed off of it, then that's going to bring some real magic. Um, so just real quickly, talking through some of the early releases. Um, in 2010, there's an EP called Songs from the Valley Below. 2012, there's a full album called The Village. Mm -hmm. um, and this was where one of the things I wanted to share about having headphones on. Um, there are so, and, and it's even going to come up as we let, we're going to include maybe some conversations about the, this topic along with Beneath the Brine because you do it there too. Um, you record it in places like a church because of the two things I think you're getting from there is the sheer different uh, audit audit audio that you would get with the way it was going to rebound off things versus a mm -hmm. recording studio, but also the energy that that performer brings by performing there instead of in a recording studio. So I'd love to hear more about that. Totally. And the other things I thought it was funny about that was it was a church in the winter, but you couldn't have the lights on or the air can, or the heat or the air or the, the lights, heat on the because it buzz, generated. Yeah. yeah. yeah he would go, so so yeah, everyone's like mic. freezing cold and, and yeah, but, cold. but yeah. it had to add to the, the sheer ambiance. Um, and then this one I thought was super cool because I went back and listened. Um, you recorded in a wood cabin for the song Backwards and Forwards, and you can actually hear a fireplace in the background. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's funny too, because we've, just like I've learned how to compose through the band, you know, sure. John, who does a lot of the, the you know, engineering um, and, and, and setup of, of all that stuff, you know, mm -hmm. um, John, you've grown exponentially through the years, just like, like I have on this end. And, and it's amazing to hear the growth for me there, you know? Um, sure. I think that, you know, a lot, of, it's funny, a lot of the using different places at the beginning mm -hmm. was mainly because, you know, there's no way to do an album like this all in the studio. There's just right. no way. It would be, yeah. Two, you money can't. number one, you know, yeah, <laughs> just buying it. studio time is yeah. right, right, know, right. outrageous. And a space right. big enough for all of those players in some of those cases, I'm sure. Yeah. Another thing to find a room that would work for that. Mm -hmm. Well, we've recorded in some pretty small spaces. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, so but it also and stuff. Yeah, it's true, right? But it also is one of those things where you know, being a knowing how to do it so that you mm -hmm. can do it. You know, that was one thing that John and I wanted to to focus on, um, and and being able to go anywhere because you don't want to have a situation. You know, if if I really want to record somebody, I don't want I don't want to affect their schedule as much as mine. So if mm -hmm. I can go to them and make it that much easier and record in their room and know how to set up in that room, great. Sure. Um, and also, uh, again, you learn things as you go. So for me, it became that realization, kind of like what you're talking about, which is, wow, like different rooms, different spaces really affect the way people perform. Yeah. You bring and a different energy and a different uh, type of game, if you will. Uh, yeah. I've seen people that 
uh, sometimes people, their best place is on stage or in a studio, like that mm -hmm. ticking clock makes yep. them feel, or it, may, it feels so professional for them that that works. Sure. But I've also known people that they only have played their instrument like to themselves in their room. And mm -hmm. that's where they're most comfortable. So why yep. would I take them somewhere else where they're not comfortable? You know, they're yeah. already going to feel like pressure being when John hits record, you know, so <laughs> that red light yeah. comes on. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, we don't have a light for just, them. Just the space bar <laughs> sound, you know, the <laughs> 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 uh, And then um, 2013 EP, The Headwinds, 14 is Beneath the Brine. We've talked about that a little bit, but that too was recorded in public spaces, places, spaces like churches, cafes, street corners, that kind of stuff. Anything uh, from that album in particular that was fun to share? Well, everything, everything we've done has been in... Uh, it, you know, the only thing we've ever really recorded in studio for the most part is bass, drums, and a few instruments that they have. Interesting. Available. Okay, cool. We did vocals for the first time in the studio on Act yeah, for 1 the, and 2. For Act 1 and 2, the vocals were done in the studio, too. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, it's mainly uh, everywhere, other places besides drum and bass. The, those first albums, The Village, uh, The Village, the, the two EPs, and Beneath the Brine mm -hmm. were those vocal. The vocals, there were all done in that. The same church you know, three hours away from in Liam's hometown, you know, with yeah. the, the whole, cause after the first time it was like, you know, the first album was like, Oh, so we can't do it, you know, any other way. Right. It's, per it's <laughs> yep. perfect. The vibe is perfect. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, we did it again yeah. and you know, it sounds great, obviously. <laughs> totally. Yeah, I agree. Uh, there's a, there's a different kind of sound to it. And now I know why, like it, it's mm -hmm. not something that is, um, in insulated and, and in studio right. perfect it's something where you were capturing something Literally almost like the all. in addition yeah, to yeah. right <laughs> right in <laughs> addition to going where the person might be comfortable or where they might be inspired to take things up a notch i also think you're using those spaces as yet another layer to the instrumentation yeah 100 percent. i mean and you have to be aware of it like some there's some things that just won't work mm -hmm. you know and like but but i remember specifically recording vocals in in that church I realized because we were set up right underneath, like at the back, uh, near like the priest's table. And yep. uh, I realized I could turn to different areas of the church and get a different reverb. Echo. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, <laughs> so like if I had to hit a really high long note, I remember the first time I, I maybe that's why I tilt my head to the right <laughs> when I Because <laughs> I, because during that album, I never used to do that, but during that, the recording process, I remember, uh, you know, in, in North, I never was going to, that's the other thing that's weird. I was never going to be a belter in this band. In my head, sure. everything was in, in my like head voice. Mm -hmm. And then I remember it became this thing of, because I was like, that's too high. And then, uh, and then we did North and it wasn't hitting. And, and mm -hmm. either John or, or our early collaborator, Cecil was like, you should try belting it. And I was like, oh God. <laughs> here we go uh, here we, yeah and thus thus it began <laughs> mm -hmm. i was like that's the only way you can do it <laughs> it doesn't work any other you way you must right. go higher yeah. <laughs> and yeah, then every just, album has been just trying to push the limit <laughs> right 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 yeah <laughs> yeah but I, I do i remember turning my head and going oh wow it sounds so much better if it's echoing right there you know and mm -hmm. You don't get to right. do that in a bedroom, obviously. I mean, that stained yeah. glass is way better than I'm that stained glass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that brings us up to this, I guess, concept. I would love to hear more about it. So yeah. like 2017 EP, Prelude to War. Mm -hmm. 2018, The War Act 1. And then 2022, The War Act 2, which just yeah. came out very, very recently. Um, maybe you could share a little bit. I'd love to bring on the first single off of Act 2 was Pride. Yeah, um, yeah. So we could bring that up a little bit and then do the kind of same kind of thing. We can fade that down and have you keep talking about it. So maybe talk about the first two parts. We'll bring on pride and then we can sure. have you keep chatting about the, the, the where it's headed to. Sure. Um, it You know, it, it's funny. The war has been a concept since the very beginning of our band. Um, and mostly actually act two, a lot of the material in act two is written um, when we were. I think when we were mixing the village. Mm. Um but it was something and it was supposed that was kind of the idea like, oh, this is going to be the second album. Um, sure. And then I wrote Brian and and it kind of spiraled from there uh, and, mm -hmm. it, and that became its own thing. Um, but yeah, we've been we've been recording it for a while and it's part of a, a, a four album concept series. And it has a story that I, I'm, I haven't yet told um, purposefully because I don't want to 
influence the way people kind of can experience the music, you sure. know, um, and want people to take whatever they, they can from it, you know, and we'll you know, have you back on when the fourth one's out and then we can have you tell the story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You got five the, hours. Yeah, um, <laughs> that'll be the appendix. Fine by me. Yeah, I don't it's care. The sort of Tolkien approach. We'll just like yeah. nine books to explain three. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, maybe we'll get Bezos to fund it too. That'd be great. <laughs> the, the podcast gets way more like everything swinging camera angles and everything uh -huh. like that. Uh -huh. Green screen stuff. Yeah, we got yeah. it. Um, but yeah, it, when we when we dove into the war series, it it that's when we you know John and I were like, well, we should do a recording tour, and we should you know we had. We'd been touring for a while and we'd met all sorts of new people through touring across the country. So mm -hmm. it went from, you know, the village was pretty much like Bay Area, California uh, and like maybe Central um, Valley. And then mm -hmm. Brine was primarily it was like West Coast because we did stuff in Portland and in Seattle and and a few other places up north. And then for the War Act one and two, it was like, well, let's let's do the the whole loop um yep 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 and so yeah just a lot of a lot of new instruments and a lot of new techniques from from an orchestration perspective and yeah it's it's a crazy it's a crazy thing to do <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and before you get to the song i have a question about yeah. that you had mentioned uh you know orchestration and all of his wonderful things about new instruments <clears throat> did either of you or members that you already had have to either learn new instruments in order to do parts that you conceived of like your brain was like i need insert instrument here that no one i know plays so we're going to figure this out or the inverse is you know someone that plays something really interesting and you're like i need to write for that because i'm so you know excited to get that on a recording it's funny because it's it. So for the live shows, a few of us have had to learn things or dive into things that we kind of knew, you know, sure. but like, but, you know, so like John plays a lot of synth uh, lines and piano stuff. And John, you know, you you've played piano for for a while, but it was kind of like me where we took lessons when we were a child. And yeah, so <laughs> not in that way, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and then like, my wife did not play piano. She is our flute player. And um, mm -hmm. she when she started playing with, she actually played timpani for us first. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, she, she learned how to play piano and she, she sings and she does all this percussion stuff. And sure. So it does for the live stuff. Laura, right? Laura yes. Bergman. Yes. Yeah. And so for the live stuff, it, it is like that for, for the recordings. Sometimes I have an idea of something specific that I, I would like to record. And then it becomes like either we can find somebody that would want to do it or, or we learn it. Or we, you know, shelved the idea if it, you know, sure. I want an octabase on the next record. I'm standing by that, <laughs> which there's only like two places you can actually use those. Yeah, it's in a museum and it's yep. a 20 feet tall or something. They got like one in Montreal like, though. I found out. So maybe we'll go to Montreal. <laughs> in Montreal. Yeah, this, uh, there, the orchestra, there has it. Um, but but then you know what's even crazier is when you have people that approach you with instruments that you've never even thought of that want to join the band. So like, sure, you know. And, and my policy is I'll write for anything. Um, and it, it makes it amazing and difficult because you're like, well, I didn't hear this originally. So how can I use this? And you, you kind of have to play puzzle. Um, <laughs> and it's also interesting because you're dealing with when you're working with new people, you never know where they are in their instrument. Right. Mm -hmm. sure, so sure. Uh, I, like I was talking about a clarinetist earlier. I remember um, <laughs> when he showed up, he showed up to a choir rehearse or choir recording and i didn't realize that he you know wanted to play he had mentioned that he played clarinet in high school but i had missed that he was gonna wanted to play it on the record so in that moment i had to write a part for him and <laughs> and i was like let's talk about like where you're at and why don't you play and then i and then i wrote the part based on that and and mm -hmm, so it does mm -hmm. the whole thing is kind of kind of interesting because you want to give everyone a chance um you know and you and and give them a soapbox you know in a way sure. um but yeah you have to kind of be malleable yeah i think what's and, just and that's just not to, always easy right. but yeah go ahead i was just gonna say just to add what i think is very interesting about liam's compositions and writing is the fact that there's actually there's a balance between very specific ideas like you know okay i hear it like this it has to be like this and you mm -hmm. know and like square forward and a balance of like 
adding something to it or and, and sure. writing something new to it, even like last minute, you know, mm-hmm. based yeah. on top of this thing that was already very, that was specific to start with, you know, and meticulous and then also adding in. So I think that that balance creates something kind of magical too in the, you I'm know, sure. in the final product, you know? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's got to be hard to say, this is the way I saw it in my head. And it's been something I've been working on for five years. And then now we're going to move it in another direction because of either the the musicians or the instruments or whatever. But that must yield just such really cool results. You know, it, it's funny because I've never actually had a moment where I have, I've like not wanted like to put something on. Like I've struggled, mm-hmm. with it, you know, um, yep. so I think, I think I, I enjoy working with people more than I think anything, you know, I, mm-hmm, I, I mm-hmm. love that process. And, um, and so you just have to kind of keep an open mind. And, and again, like we've been doing this now for so long, the more instruments that you understand or, or have a template for in your head, the more tones you understand. Sure. You know? So it's, it, you can place something in a different place that, uh, you know, Oh, well, this kind of is right in between an oboe and a violin. So it's kind of mm-hmm. high endy and, and piercing to some degree. Yep. So I'll write something in that pocket for that, you know, um, it sounds like the way a chef approaches a recipe, like, well, I don't yeah, have, kind of. I don't have cumin, so I'm going to have to use these other things to make up for that same kind of. That, yeah. That's a know, good analogy, actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot like so, that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So bringing us back to the war, I want to play the, uh, a little bit of pride here, um, which in addition to being a great song is one of the coolest videos ever <laughs> has a very like, um, uh, holy, uh, the, 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 the Hindu celebration, holy, um, yeah. where they throw colors at each other. Um, it has that kind of really cool vibe to it. So we're going to let it play a little bit and then we'll kind of have you guys keep talking about this, the, the concept of the war. For um, sure. yeah. So you can see here that I was showing this for somebody and they were like, Oh, that's such a beautiful guitar. <laughs> <laughs> that was hard to do. Yeah. <laughs> but you can see where the colors are coming in. No super expensive instruments were harmed in the making of this video. That's what I yeah. assured her. I was yeah. like, uh... like, we went around on Craigslist and got them. <laughs> got some cheap ones. said you won't go, you said you won't go, cause it's all down from the way things are. You said you won't go, you said you won't go. And John, you're you're a very kinetic bass player. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of movement going on. I think I think what I always say is what I what I lack in maybe like raw skill on playing the bass, I make up for in my my state presence and movement, you know? <laughs> you know, it's funny, John always like is like kind of self-deprecative about his like yeah. music um yep. but john started out as a guitar player and when we formed the band we'd been doing primarily acoustic shows and it, john kind of came in after i think one of the first two shows and was like you know we don't really need another guitar in this band why don't, why don't, i could play bass and so we found a bass on on Craigslist, a really good bass, a good one, <laughs> not not one of the ones in this music. Video. Not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and he like locked him. We, at that point, we lived with each other, and this was his room actually. And um, he locked himself in his room in a weird way for like, I didn't really see him. But you know, he'd go to work, come home, and then be in here for about two weeks. And he came out and was like, I'm ready to go. And he's a phenomenal bass player. I mean, he has a an amazing ear. Uh, I mean, he can play. I, I, I couldn't do this without John. Honestly. It just turned out, I turned out I was just better at bass than I ever was at guitar. That's ultimately <laughs> what it was. It was like, Oh, Oh, I'm like, Pat, like actually good at this. Like instead of yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like trying to compete with every other guitarist in the world, you know, <laughs> but what I will say is like, you know, John, his uh, live performance is crazy. And it's, it's, it's awesome to have John on stage because anytime I'm tired, I can like look over and see him just like in like John mode and, and you <laughs> John kinda, mode like, enabled. Yeah. And, 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 you know, our whole thing throughout 
the band has always been, no matter what, sound has always been an issue. You know, you're dealing with mm -hmm. a seven piece band. So if you're going to have sound issues, you better just play your heart out, no matter who's there, if there's two people or 500, whatever. And uh, sure. so, yeah, so from day one, like even if we were playing a cafe, that's kind of, we just jump around and go nuts. And John's always been like at the forefront, <laughs> but mm -hmm, John played mm -hmm. in like like metal bands before this, and so I, I think I, that's before part before of it. meeting Liam, I was yeah playing metal bands like all screaming metal, you know, ah, you know. So that's right, I, right, I, right. I guess that's how I, that's where I learned to like rock out hard. And sure, I tried to take sure, sure, that sure. you know into bring that energy full rock I guess. Yeah. <laughs> into <laughs> orchestral yeah indie rock band. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, were, you were like raised on like you know pop punk and and hard rock and i was like mm -hmm. indie rock and moody stuff yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Maybe, no, so. maybe that's the perfect combo right there yeah <laughs> i wanted to take a quick second to point out the other band members so in addition to laura um on keys and and in that particular one she was on keyboards you had uh jerry lou on cello mm -hmm. christian maselli on drums lauren so that... pie saxophone and it might be different people in the video yeah. this was just off your off your your website and owen sutter on violin but if you want to give anybody else any credit yeah, so Javier um, was on drums. He's insane. Um, yeah, the music insane. video that was Javier. And then um, let's see, who am I? Who am I? Uh, Doug Pett was on saxophone. Oh, Doug, in the music right. video. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Who also Doug, has an amazing solo on the water's fine and beneath the brine. That's Doug Pett playing saxophone solo, which is one of I think one of our top like magical moments in recording oh, yeah. which awesome. is you know letting that guy go off and it's just like the song that song's in five and he just like rips <laughs> it so and that was in the studio too which is like kind of a yeah, last that was, minute like we're like in the middle of mixing i think or recording sure, drums sure, sure. or something yeah, like this needs like, something yeah, yeah doug yeah. did doug's done he quite a few things that. he did he was the sax on boat and um one of Make probably boat, yeah. my favorite recording session of all time um it was we could talk about it now yeah because it was on act two and we're always like we can't talk you know it's like, oh yeah this song that's coming out you'll hear it <laughs> yeah. you know this thing actually. trust me it's so boss. now we can talk about it we can talk about the song it's baby you got your legs right right mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we have uh, this was th this was a lesson in like personality with instruments to me right so we have a friend chris ward who's just a phenomenal sax player like Sure. Crazy. New York jazz scene just like yeah. rips. Uh, and he's he's very he's very fast. Um, and uh, his soloing style is more uh, like lassoed chaos in a weird way. Like uh, he, I mean, he can play anything, but like when he really mm -hmm, gets mm -hmm. into it, it's it's like more beboppy and less sure modern beboppy and you know. And his personality, he's like a really intense person. You know, he's. Yep one of my favorite people he's you know and doug <laughs> is incredibly laid back and he's very not quiet but he's you know yeah he's he's, he's laid just back. amazing because he's also and to, on top of being an amazing saxophone player he's also like a doctor and a lawyer or something <laughs> He's like, sure. was a I mean, lawyer, and then now he's why a doctor. Not dude, I would be a doctor instead, and now he's a yeah, doctor. Yeah. It's like, oh, come on, dude. You make yeah. this all look bad. Oh, and I also <laughs> wrote this 500-page perfect novel. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, and I'm a pilot yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's an astronaut, too. You know. yeah, and I right. volunteer at the uh, soup kitchen right now exactly. at the same time yeah, somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Probably does. That probably does. Kind of yeah, he would not put that he's straight, Yeah, he's, John's not even joking. He was a lawyer, and then he decided he, he couldn't, like, I think it was, I think, honestly, it was even he told me that it was because he couldn't help enough people through law so he went <laughs> yeah. I'm be a doctor. and then he when he got his law degree he like double majored in law and sex so he had a double music he had the music degree as well and he's one of the best sax players i've ever seen like he's mm. just his his uh you know everything that he does is just so well it's like perfect you can't really sure. So we had recorded for Baby You've Got Your Legs. We were kind of trying to do a Steely Dan Asia thing <laughs> for <laughs> solos where we're just going to record a bunch of people and record see which one should see what works, right? you know. Yep, yep. And we recorded Chris, and it was this amazing solo. And then when we were in Nashville, that's where Doug was at the time, he came in and we were like, well, let's try Doug doing the solo. So Doug records a few things, and he did, I think, probably eight takes, but we ended we after the first one we're like we don't need it and he's like no 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 i gotta do more i think we ended up using the first take 
Mm -hmm. But to give you an idea, on Baby You've Got Your Legs, there's two saxes going on in that song, and they're kind of wow. echoing each other. We didn't, Chris did not hear or know that there would be another sax. He recorded mm -hmm. his line. He recorded first. that first, yeah. We didn't know there would be another sax. So Doug recorded his line without Chris. As if it was As going to be was, the only one. Yeah, because yeah, it's like one, we're just right? getting different sure. ideas. So we're all sitting there in the studio and we're like, well, why don't we just play them together to see, haha, it'd be funny. Right. What kind of it'll, be a, it'll be a mess. Yeah, it'll right. be great. It'll yeah. be a disaster. <laughs> we hit play and, it, and it's like the guy who's intense, Chris, his personality, he takes the front end of a section. So it's like, it's like, so that'd be like Chris. Mm -hmm. But then, Naturally, Doug was taking the end of the phrase and mm -hmm. taking this response without hearing the call. So it'd, you'd get this like, and it was it was just bizarre. <laughs> and and then halfway through the solo, they'd start harmonizing with each other in the same without line. knowing they're doing without it. Without knowing they're yeah. doing it, wow. and then there's one phrase where for some reason Doug decided to take the start of the phrase that Chris decided to take the end of the phrase. Wow. So it's just like opposite. That's just the universe. Like, like it's just, yeah. ma it's so when you know that and you listen yep. to it. So next time you listen it's just, to it, it's just it's left, so right. I think it's hand hard left. Yeah. Hand, I was right. just going to ask, is it mixed? Solos. So that you guys mix them? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think it's really one, great. one is one oh, side. That one is, is the other. So again, back to needing headphones to really yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> that one specifically. Yeah. And there's, yeah. there's, I think at the end of that too, we wanted a cacophony of noise to, so I think that has the most soloists at one time we've ever recorded because there's a clarinet. By the end, yeah, by the by end, the of, end the of the song, it, then there's the last like, a like bunch stanza of, you a have bunch of something like going on, yeah. ten or twelve people soloing at one time. Sure, sure, um, sure. But yeah, it's that guy Doug is just he's and he's so nice. You know, you're like so you have all this stuff that you're good at and you're nice. Like you shouldn't be nice. You should right. there's gotta be you something, know, right? Like there's like <laughs> bad breath. No, like everything is great. He's a good dad as well. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> he can spell words, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that is a great, great story. And also just a great intro to additionally super talented musicians. So uh, love hearing stories like that. Thank you so much. Yeah, of um, course. But you did pick up the guitar there. I was wondering if maybe sure. if you have time, you want to play something. I heard you might play a song called uh, In Your Arms Tonight. I, I think I can do it. Let's let's hope this whole thing works out. Uh, we're... And then when you shout to the right... It's when I because of the, light, the church, it's, yeah, <laughs> back, <laughs> think church back during pulling it out. <laughs> All right, let me also we'll come off screen and give you center stage here while I tune. So, this song, uh, I'm gonna play it different than the way that it is on the record because it's obviously on an acoustic guitar and I don't have the bombastic 500,000 people. Um, but this song I wrote uh, for my wife um, around the time we first started dating. And I, sh I used to play it for her when uh, over the phone because she was in L.A. at the time. And I was I was in I was in San Francisco. This is called In Your Arms Tonight. It's been love years and years since you've been someone else's love. Slow the ground gives way beneath our feet. My love, my sweet, she knows me now. When I come around, lover, lover, come around. Waking of the world, and all I wanted was you. And all I wanted was to be with you. All I wanted was. 
in your arms tonight, in your arms tonight, in your arms tonight. Shake me now, the words are holding out to fight the silence and Waiting for you slowly holds me down. The ground is wearing thin, but it's never ever gonna change. Never ever ever gonna change the way I feel about you. And all I wanted was to be with you. And all. Tonight, oh, and all I wanted was to be with you. And all I wanted was to be in your arms, in your arms tonight, in your arms tonight, in your arms tonight. Wake me like it's been love years and years since you've been sleeping next to me. And slowly I can feel you coming around. Outstanding. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. I swapped to nylon string during the pandemic for quite a bit. And uh, it's a totally different experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, it was stunning and, and beautiful. And thank you so much for sharing that today. Of course. Thanks. Thanks for having us. I mean, it's always fun to play. Yeah. And, and especially I love playing these songs in like different ways. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's definitely very cool. Um, if you don't mind, Liam, I did want to touch on a little more of a serious note because I mm -hmm. think it's important. Um, you wrote an article uh, a little bit ago, um, and it was titled Go Home, Growing Up Biracial in America. Right. And I just think it's it's something important for people to hear more about um, and not only just be aware, obviously, of, you know, BS racial nonsense mm -hmm. in the world, but how that impacts people, because you got very vulnerable in the article. You you shared how that makes it started when you were six years old, which is incredible to think about. And it sticks with you. Um, and then how you were made to feel in high school and different things that I just thought someone like myself, I can't walk in your shoes. I can't um, I would never know what that would feel like, but I can 
obviously have massive empathy for it and then share you um, let you have a moment to share a little bit more about that and even if you just want to point people to the article because it's painful or whatever like just wanted to make sure we touched on that for a moment because i appreciate uh, that, that there's blind spots for people like myself that we just don't know that until we hear it and then we go oh my gosh that's awful i mean i think there's blind spots for all of us sure when it comes to culture and race and things you know um yeah that that obviously when when the pandemic hit you know it there was a lot of anti-Asian sentiment happening throughout the country. Um, sure, sure, sure. I, I grew up in a very, very white area. Um, and it's interesting, like growing up as the Asian, <laughs> you know, like there's there were like <laughs> sure. four of us. Right. Um, growing up in that way, you kind of realize that people are, there's two big differences in the, like the idea of racism as a whole and calling mm -hmm. someone a racist, like there's there's two different kinds of racism, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's multiple kinds, but really, sure. it's like there's passive racism where it's where it's somebody doesn't realize they don't think they're being hurtful. They're just they don't understand that it's hurtful. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. it's like I, I had friends that would do this to me, and, and yeah, it, yeah, yeah, right. You know, and it wasn't something that like they were trying to hurt me. They were they weren't even really trying to make fun of me, but mm -hmm. it did affect me right but it stings Absolutely. and then there's the other mm -hmm. side of it where it's aggressively like you know name calling like tr trying to hurt you mm -hmm. and most of the people i mean all of the people that 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 were ever that way to me growing up were people that did not understand why they felt that way you know um it, it's and it makes it really sad because the, a you know i knew they didn't have a whole lot of access to culture outside sure. of like white American culture there. I mean, mm -hmm. we didn't have the internet that much when I was mm -hmm. growing up and you know, even cable, not everybody had. So it's like, whatever's on TV is what you're getting. Right, um, right. But also it comes a lot from the parents and, you know, maybe this kid's grandfather, you know, was, or, or, or uncle was in Vietnam, saw a bunch of people killed by people that looked like me, even though I'm not Vietnamese. Um, and, sure. and was speaking this rhetoric over and over and over, right, right, right. you know, and that your, kid, your, your mother's side is Chinese. Your father's side Chinese. is, is, uh, Irish, is right? Irish, Irish, English? British. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, but, but you know, he, maybe that kid came home and was like, you know, first time they saw me, they didn't think anything of it. They don't, maybe they'd seen Kung Fu movies or something, but mm -hmm. they're like, mom, dad, what's this? And whatever comes out of their God figure parents mouth at that moment is how they're sure. going to interpret me until yes. they learn different. Correct. So. I grew up with a lot of weird empathy for it, like trying to, you know, not be too angry about it. And, and mm -hmm. more from like an educational, like I'm the only access they have to someone that looks like me. So right. You feel even more pressure. Um, yeah. But I hadn't experienced a whole lot of that stuff until the pandemic really started up again. And then mm -hmm. it, I remember like right away, I was walking down the street um, in San Francisco and, and I'd read about a few things and that was the first time I'd felt unsafe walking down the street in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I used to run in my neighborhood at night and I honestly still don't because it's, wow. it, you don't know. And, and so, yeah, I was, I knew I would be asked um, to, to write something by someone. And I sure. knew, cause I'm, I mean, most people can't name it five Asian male front men of bands. If I, if their life depended on it, you know, right. Right. And so it's like, well, even if I'm not, you know, I'm not Andrew Bird famous, I'm like the only one they have, you know? Sure. Right. Um, and then that would be like the other side of this coin is you're now going to be inspirational to young Chinese Americans who now realize they can go do that where they might not have if they didn't have that role model. Yeah. I mean, it has to start somewhere, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I was really, I mean, I was so lucky uh, the people at Paste asked me to do this. Mm -hmm. because when I started doing it, you know, I, I didn't, I've, I've always been able to like, if you were to ask me to tell you a story of something terrible that happened to me involving racism, I could tell you and I wouldn't feel anything. It's right. very strange. Yeah. But um, when I was asked to write about it and I put all of that on paper mm -hmm. and then I read it and then it was released, it wasn't until it was released that I realized how vulnerable it was. And I felt sure. actually really nervous Mm -hmm. But also that I I was for the first time in a long time I was angry because I mm -hmm. suddenly was seeing all this at one time. Yeah. And and the thing that really 
is hard to deal with now in my life is that I don't know if being Asian has had an effect on my career. I mean, I do know it has had an effect on my career because obviously well, in there you even shared certain people were giving you, again, you're talking about like, mm -hmm. they think they're, they're giving you advice to help mm -hmm. you look less Asian. And it's obviously incredibly disrespectful, but also now making you feel like those are not positive traits of yours where they clearly are. But and then I'm now you're also carrying the burden, which I think you're about to share is, are you holding your band members back? That it, that's always been really hard for me. And that that hit me so hard when I read that that I was like, oh my god! I, like the, to have to feel that you're carrying that. I just I felt for you in the moment, and it just was something I wanted to make sure we brought up here. Yeah, that's the hardest thing for me because like my I love. I mean, we are a family, and mm -hmm. there was mm -hmm. a moment when I was when I was thinking about it, even before I wrote this article, that I, that's a big fear because I don't know how much this has affected my career. And, you know, people are like, oh, well, I can't be that bad. It's like, well, if it wasn't that bad, you'd name five Asian frontmen right now. But there's a reason why that doesn't exist. And, right. and you know, I think, like you said, the first step is just acknowledging it sure. and, and trying to keep an open mind to things. And luckily we're seeing it changing ever so slowly. I highly recommend, there's a documentary on uh, Jeremy Lin called I think mm -hmm. 38 on HBO. So anybody okay. watching and that wants to understand this more viscerally, they mm -hmm. do a really good job of explaining this issue because uh, it's not just in music and film, it's in sports. I mean, sure. part of the reason it was mm -hmm. shocking to people is they'd never seen right. a, an Asian basketball player. And I, I mean, I didn't know a lot about, I'm not a big sports guy. I didn't know a lot about Jeremy Lin mm -hmm. um, before watching it, but it's so eye opening, and and it made me feel a lot of uh, mixed emotions because I was really sure. proud, but I was really angry when I was watching it yeah. as well. You know, um, but thank you for bringing that up because um, yeah, it's it's a paste article. So if you guys watch, I will it, I will link to it in our show notes. But in beyond that, I'm gonna post it as its own post just because I, again, I think it's a better way to get people's eyes on it and make it easier for people to click on it. But uh, thank you. It's, a, it's an important read. Like it's not not easy but it's something that you need to be aware of and you need to you know hopefully you know be a part of the change like like you even said there's that passive part of it where it's like if you're not trying to do something to stop it from happening then you're not part like you know what i mean like the one thing it's I not learned... enabling but at the same point go Ooh. out of your way to maybe make some of this stuff go away a lot of th your instinct i think when it comes to not just racism but but anything where you're you're being held back um but in racism the instinct for a lot of people is, oh, this again, mm -hmm. I'm just going mm -hmm. to ignore it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of a safety mechanism. And it's that's fair. You know, um, people can only do what they can do. And it's really sure. hard to know that you're limited in, in, just because of the way you look. For me, I grew up, in, a, like I said, in a very white area. I only knew the Asians in my family. So mm -hmm. it's even mm -hmm. harder for me because I'm like, I don't even... I'm, I'm basically being like judged for something that I don't even understand fully, you know? Right, right, right. Um, right. But, but I think that like putting the way to deal with this kind of stuff is to talk about it. Or, and, Absolutely. And, and I, you know, you guys bringing this up is just amazing. And I really appreciate it. Honestly. Absolutely. No, it, it, like I said, I think it's an important thing to put out there for people to, to hear and listen and read about and, and realize that being silent or not talking about it is only letting it perpetuate and, and get worse. And when, when it gets amplified by somebody in power, then if we didn't make progress while it was quiet, then it only just, you know, makes it come right back again. Right. And things are changing. They're, they're, they're probably going to change slowly, but they're changing and that's all yep. that matters, you know? Absolutely. So, yeah. So yeah, thank you for, for sharing that and for your courage in writing the article in the first place. I think that that's, again, those are some of those very important steps. So, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so bringing us back to, 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 to the band and to, to the more positive stuff Yes. Uh, and, and back to the story about when I first heard you and unfortunately haven't heard you again since right. probably because of the, the, the coastal <laughs> difference, um, was you played music fest 2018. I'm wearing my 2018 music fest t-shirt today in honor of our interview. Um, and five o'clock, uh, I only know that because I went back and just took, took a look at the pictures I took. Here's a picture I took of, of your set. You were on the Levitt stage. Um, unfortunately you have this outfit you typically wear as a band of being in all black. I'm sure it was 12 million degrees that day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's and funny. that stage gets blasted with the sun it does this performance actually holds a huge part in our history 
because oh, very uh, cool. because we were so hot. Uh, <laughs> we, I've never to my in my entire life. Um, you know, we we showed up, and if you've never been to Bethlehem, it's I mean, obviously you guys have, but to the listeners, it's no, yes, so please beautiful and and they have uh what is the smokestacks right that's steel stacks steel stacks, steel stacks. Yeah. and actually uh, i have a picture farther back i'll bring it up while you're talking yeah. about it this is in case you've never been there that's what it looks like behind the feels, stage of where they're super like, cool it yeah. feels otherworldly it's honestly it feels yes. like you're in like mario brothers or something it's just these <laughs> massive things in the clouds yep. and so we were really excited to play um and and it was a, almost it wasn't a hundred, but it was almost a hundred, I believe. But it was like incredibly humid. Yes. And I remember, you know, we set up and and we had a few, um, maybe like forty minutes before we went out on stage, and I I remember the first thing, you know, really really hot. I sweat a lot on stage as it is. If you've ever seen a video of me, I'm first song, I'm just drenched. Yeah. I turned around and I saw our drummer. And he was, you know, usually you're sitting playing and he was like standing up playing. And I'm like, what is happening here? And and then eventually he sat down. And then during the set, I on stage, I'm not this isn't a joke. I passed out twice on stage, like very briefly. But like I, I went to sing a like long high note. Sure. And I literally felt myself go and then go to on my foot. And by the time we, I think we played an hour 20. And by the time we got off stage, I passed out and like landed in a bunch of guitar cases Holy because cow. it was so hot on that stage. Wow. The reason my drummer was standing was because his seat was so hot. Was this he getting, actually got a burn. Yeah. It was just getting fried what? before we played because the sun was just directly on it. Yeah. Get down on it for like 10 minutes. Yeah. Oh. It was, and I remember. Or, yeah. We got off stage. And I've heard all sorts of stories about the hot music fest, like the problems it creates. I've never heard anything like this. This is great. Oh, it was. I crazy. mean, I'm sure it wasn't great in the moment, but <laughs> yeah, but you know, fantastic see, story. I'm really strange because a the I mean the audience was amazing and the again the location's amazing, and I mean I weirdly I weirdly like even even if it's a hard experience it, like mm -hmm. i like when you come out of it successful and you can say well sure. i've done that because mm -hmm. everything else is easier you know once you've done right, something right. like that yeah. no you're right yeah and it tests your tests kind of what you're made of um and i i just remember like we all after that show luckily there were showers but i, I stood underneath the shower for like <laughs> in my clothes for i think 20 minutes and all right it was a hose but whatever i was getting it was, it was, it was probably a hose but uh, yeah it was something yeah, yeah. but I, I yeah but i remember like we all ended up um dropping 25 pounds yeah well, i mean i lost weight on that for sure i got sick <laughs> the next day because i think I, I got heat stroke but it yeah, was definitely. it was absolutely worth it because again it was it was a it's a beautiful town the people that work for the festival were all just super awesome um, the yeah, crowd was amazing. I, I would do it again, honestly. Like even mm -hmm, knowing mm -hmm. like that, I would do it again. Because well, let's hope we can get you either seven or nine, and it's a little bit maybe the sun's down. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that you deserve a difference. slot like that anyway. Yeah, um, we're from San Francisco. Like if it's beyond sixty-nine degrees, and it's a <laughs> yes. nightmare for us. It's so, so, <laughs> no, you're right. Yeah, thing. San Fran has maybe a very wasn't that hot, yeah. but for mm -hmm. us, it was awful <laughs> yeah so, it was 75 it was like right, 76 yeah. degrees like what is this <laughs> i thought we were in pennsylvania aren't we almost yeah. in the mountains how is this yeah, possible yeah. exactly no, yeah music fest has a way of always being ridiculous like it, it just some some reason it's that's the week that's the hottest and the most humid yeah oh, yeah i mean it was but it's a it's a great festival and honestly pennsylvania is one of my favorite states i'm obsessed with pittsburgh nice and, yeah and so anytime i get to play anywhere in pennsylvania i love it but um, yeah, hopefully well, we'll to that end, we'll it, back, it, that's what I was just going to ask. Like, is there like, so you just recently played your first live show since pre pandemic. So, yeah. and that was locally. Th is there a tour coming? Does it include the East coast? Yeah. So probably we're hoping to get out there by the spring. Um, awesome. The industry is because of the pandemic. It's, yep. you know, it's always every year it gets more wild west, but it's very wild west right now because sure. There's a lot of venues that shut down during the pandemic, which is heartbreaking. Yes. Yes. Um, but I guess we need more condos, you know. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Apartments, condos, Music dry cleaners, dollar condos. stores. We need more of those. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of venues closed and uh, a, a lot of bands, 
I couldn't make it through, but a lot, you know, started. And so it's really about just trying to figure out when things are available. But yeah, we're shooting for spring, um, getting out there and we'll definitely uh, be coming through Pennsylvania. So please do. Please do. Uh, Like for us personally, um, obviously Philly or New York City would both work. If you want to play in Bethlehem, uh, we'll book you right here in my front lawn if you'd like. Be... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a lot cooler. Uh, it won't be August temperatures. But um, no, but seriously, hope that, uh, you know, that we get to hear about uh, like a tour getting pulled together soon. Um, and then I'm guessing, obviously, it'll start out west. And then, um, you know, hopefully it comes this way. Music Fest, too, would be great to have you back for that one, too, because you're that kind of a band. Like that day that I walked up and you know, read about you and the way I kind of build who I'm going to go see each day. It sounded like the type of band I would want to check out, walked up and within, you know, being 500 yards away, I was like, oh, hell yeah, I'm in. (laughs) And then, like I was saying, like four years ago, I saw over four years ago, I saw you play and I started a podcast about six months ago and you were on my list still to this day to want to go talk to, to learn more about what you guys do and, and everything. So we appreciate that so much. I mean, anytime anybody likes what we do, that's, I mean, that's, why we do it you know we hope yeah. people like the music and and we love playing live so yeah i mean if, if if music fest uh if we ever have another opportunity we'll do it for sure yeah yeah because it's a oh, great absolutely. spot it is it is it's a special time for sure um and like i said hopefully we just keep you out of the sun this time around. <laughs> or <laughs> you know I, I could use another 10 pounds that's good <laughs> <laughs> you gotta bulk um, up beforehand to know you know yeah no, i'll okay. just shed the pandemic weight that's like the it's best a- way to do it <laughs> <laughs> So Liam McCormick, John Cedarland, the family crest, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for your talent and for everything you, you, you give out there in songwriting and, and, and in performance. Thank you for performing today live on the show. Um, can't thank you guys enough. It was a true honor to have you guys on the show. Well, thank, thank you, you so much us. for having us. And if anybody listening wants to, uh, to make music with us and join the extended family, as we call it, all the information is on our website, which is thefamilycrest.com. So just check it out. And That's right. And you also have a Discord for non-musicians that can just kind of get that contact. Yeah. Anybody. Well, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anybody that wants to talk to us, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a Discord out there, too. If you, like, if you have Discord, you can go and connect right to them through that, Yeah, yeah too, the link's so. on the website for that as well, so... And everybody oh, totally. in that Discord, honestly, like the most Great wonderful people. human beings yeah. on the planet. So <laughs> get prepared awesome. for a love fest if you go in there. <laughs> well, again, thank you again so much for coming on. So thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. David? Philip. That was, I, I want to become part of the family. I might start taking lessons just so I can become, uh, go on stage. And yeah, he's going to ask it. where you're at with your instrument. And you're going to be like, yeah. to the left of it? Well, yeah, it's over like, here. No, that's not what I meant. And you're going to... Um, but uh, I could just play triangle or something just Electric to, just to have it. <laughs> Electric triangle. Maybe you exactly. got this giant effects rig to make it the sounds that you need. Yeah. Uh, but what great you know, that stories. Was fantastic. That was fantastic. We heard a lot. And yes. that's amazing. And I'm so happy that they could spend the time with us like that. That was yes. uh, really wonderful. The performance was great. Hearing details about things. Now I want to go deep dive into dueling sax solos. Oh my and, gosh, that's absolutely what I'm doing next. And uh, it's um, that w- that was really nice. That was great. Yes, I yeah, didn't get yeah. a chance to read all 500 people. Uh, that will be in the addendum where I'll do that afterwards, and we'll tack that on. So we have all of that ready. Yeah, to it'll go. be in the subreddit about the show. Correct. I'll do it. At, like, all right, Phil. Let, let's say goodbye to everybody. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed this episode of Your Next Favorite Band. We'd like to sincerely thank Liam McCormick, John Cedarlin from The Family Crest, as well as the whole rest of the band for all that they do and provide for us to listen to and enjoy. Can't wait to see them hopefully perform live out this way soon. Um, there will be links to, in the show notes to their website, Spotify, YouTube, Bandcamp, um, as well as um, uh, the article that we talked about during the uh, during the, uh, the episode here called uh, Go Home, Growing Up Biracial in the United States. Um, just think that that's important stuff to check out. And like I said, the more important part, support the band, um, buy merch from them directly, go see their shows um, and let them know uh, how much you enjoy their music. As always, our hope here on Your Next Favorite Band is to uh, you know, bring you your next favorite. 
Um, if you happen to already know the Family Crest and you tuned in, thank you so much. We hope you might subscribe, uh, you know, like and follow us on social media, um, YouTube, and even the podcast that we have um, so that you might be able to get introduced to other next favorites. Um, and we've got lots more coming. So let's hope uh, you, uh, you tune in and let's catch a live show soon.